in Dara, where the revolution started. It started with schoolboys who uh, graffitied the words, uh, people want the downfall of the regime, the slogan of the Arab Spring. These kids were taken and tortured and their fingernails were plucked off. And I was an English teacher, so they could have been my students. And uh, I joined hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Syrians who could not condone these things and started peacefully protesting. The pandemic has thrown up many people who've been called heroes, but the person I'm about to interview, I think, absolutely exemplifies that, that tagline. He's somebody who came to this country as a refugee from Syria on a very torturous journey. Uh, he then won a BAFTA for a powerful film that he made about his journey. And then in the pandemic, he became a cleaner on a COVID ward of a hospital, risking his life to help save others. So it's my great pleasure and privilege, and I really mean that, to introduce Hassan Akkad. Hassan, Thank it's you. good to meet you. Great Finally. to meet you too. <laughs> I've interviewed you several times on Good Morning Britain, yeah. uh, but I've never had the pleasure of meeting you, and I really wanted to do this. You know, some of these things can be a chore. This is not one of them, yeah. because I find your story one of the most inspiring stories, not just about the pandemic, but about your life what you've done with it and the impact that you've had. So we're going to go through it all, okay. your greatest hits. Um, but I want to take you back at the start to Damascus in, in Syria 10 years ago and a, a dinner table with your family. It could be any night, um, but your life then, what was it like and who were you leading your life with at that dinner table? So we lived in a flat in... Um very close to the center of Damascus. Uh, it was a really lovely three-bedroom flat on the eighth floor with an amazing balcony. And I'm one of five, so I have a brother and three sisters. My dad, uh, he had a, re a pizza restaurant, and I was always known to be the son of a, of a, um, a pizza restaurant owner, <laughs> which was a great reputation amongst my friends because I would always provide pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my brother worked for a bank. Uh, my sisters did part-time jobs. I was an English teacher. I started working in a shop and then I became an English teacher. So we, we led a very comfortable life. Uh, but because family plays a very essential role in the culture in Damascus, Syria, or the Arab world in general, we, don't, we never left the family apartment. And we would always sit around that dinner table. Like, and uh, life was full of love and hope. It was very joyous. Joy. Yes, it was, very, it was a very joyous life. I, was, I had tons of friends. We went to gigs and went out. I was a 21, 22, so like I was in my early 20s. I had a, I had a great time. It was, it, was, it was a brilliant life, but that was a, on the surface because Syria is, a, is run by a totalitarian regime. Um, but we did lead a very normal life and um, very comfortable life. And um, just, just being in that flat, honestly, like uh, it's everything that I ever needed because I, I would never leave that flat until I get married. And uh, um, it, was, it was my comfort zone. It was everything that I, I, I wanted in life to, to, to remain around my siblings and my parents. So I now want to go to 2011. <clears throat> I was at CNN in America. And I remember suddenly this extraordinary seismic event swirling through the Middle East, the Arab Spring uprisings as a lot of young people just said enough yeah. of these totalitarian regimes and rose up in these mass protests and one of them of course was Syria you felt compelled to join these protests why because I was the one percent so I told you I was I was making quite a lot of money and I we had like three cars in our household but many Syrians weren't leading that life and uh, I, was very, I, was, I, was, I was too minded about joining the protest initially because the Assad regime, their reputation precedes them. They're, they're known to be, they, they've been ruling Syria with an iron grip for almost four decades now. And when I, similar to you, I was watching the protests uh, ignited in Tunisia and waving through North Africa all the way to Syria, I, did, I wasn't sure that it was the right thing to do because of the consequences. And it's something that our parents know, that, like, are very well aware of. But ours, like the young generation, we were, we were not. Until 
what happened in Dara'a, because in the south, in the in South Syria, in Dara'a, where the revolution started, it started with schoolboys who uh, graffitied the words uh, "People want the downfall of the regime," the slogan of the Arab Spring. These kids were taken and tortured, and their fingernails were plucked off. And I was an English teacher, so they could have been my students. And uh, I joined hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Syrians who could not condone these things and started peacefully protesting. After a few months of protesting, you were caught by the police. You were put in prison. You were tortured, electrocuted. You almost lost a leg. Tell me about this. It was only 15 days, but it sounds utter hell. It was 14 days, and um, I got arrested in a, in a protest. We got besieged by the, by the Mukhabarat, and the word Mukhabarat sends so much fear in, in Syrians' hearts because it's the secret police, and there are no rules and no guidelines. It's not like being prison in England. There are, you're in a dungeon. So I, uh, I got arrested and I got beaten up very badly. So both of my arms got severely broken my ribs and my left leg because of electrocution and beat, too much beating. I, uh, what, how would they beat you? With iron poles. Iron poles? Yeah, so when they arrested us, ironically, I got arrested. We were hiding in a school. Uh, we, we ran away from the protest. We hid in a school backyard and they came for us and uh, for 20 minutes with iron poles. And I was trying to protect my face because <laughs> I did have a, a nice face and I didn't want to lose it. But my, 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 my arms just couldn't take anymore and they got broken. And then I had a panic attack, so they started jumping on my chest to give me CPR, so they shattered my ribs. And then my leg followed suit and uh, it was one of the worst, exp like if not the worst experience of my life because it's, um, you have so many scars, but the scars dig emotional scars and mental scars. Did you think you'd get out of there? Never, th no, <laughs> I didn't. But be I, I got out of there because of privilege. Because uh, my privilege got me out, because I had connections. Mm. I had someone who can get, get there and get me out. And um, didn't want to leave, because the, the misconception here is that people in the cradle, they, in, in the Middle East, they're told to go to the West, go to America or Europe. I never wanted to leave, so I stayed. I got arrested again. <laughs> well, I'm going to come to that. So then the barrel bombing started. Uh, Assad obviously was uh, going on the offensive. Um, a lot of people were being killed now, killed in prison cells again. You end up in jail again, don't you? And this comes after you had an extraordinary one-on-one -on -one encounter with Assad. Tell me how that came about. My connection who got me out of prison the first time told she was she had a good connection with, with, with Assad, so she told him that they sh she gave him an advice to stop torturing people. And he said, well, that's not happening. She said, well, my own cousin, because she's my late cousin, um, she said that happened to him. Uh, and uh, he said, well, bring him so I, I want to meet him. So I went to meet him. And my naivete was quite high because I thought I would be the person who will go and change his mind. So I went in and I told him everything that I had witnessed. Were you nervous as you went in? I mean, I was, I could hear my own heartbeats because um, it's like going to meet your rapist. It's, he's the person who was in charge of my torture. So it's not something that I, <laughs> sorry, I'm shaking because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, um, so I was very nervous. This, it, just to stop you for a moment, <laughs> you are shaking. And is that because your mind is being transported back to Yeah. Where you had to come face to face with this guy? Yes, yes. Every time and I'm, I'm telling the story, I'm reliving these experiences. And this is, again, this very unu it's not something that I thought that I would live. You know, I was 23 years old. It's very unusual for me. And it's uh, even going back to think about it, still, it's still difficult. But uh, yes, I went because I wanted to change his mind. And it, um, we had an hour and a half chat. Where? That's extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> you had that. I mean, for someone who's never met Assad, I tried to interview him, but always got yeah. rejected. What was he like to meet, and how did the encounter go for those 90 minutes? You know, Assad was an eye doctor in London. He was never meant to, 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 to lead Syria. It was meant to be his older brother who died in a car crash in 1994. So when I met him, he does not look like, he's not like Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi, you know? He hasn't got this dictatorship... Um, um, aura around him. So he was 
like a, and he looked like a nice guy, and he was not speaking, you know, the formal Arabic that he speaks on TV. He was speaking slang, and he 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 did look like a nice guy, and I and I uh, I, I felt comfortable around him. And the first thing that I said, I said, if I say the things that I came here to say, will I be able to go back home? And he said, oh yeah, definitely. But every, every time I said something, you know when you interview politicians and they're always manipulative, they always go around yes, and say, <laughs> I do. it's the story of your Don't life. Don't worry, <laughs> I know. So it's the same thing. I asked him a question, I was, like, I was like, why are you torturing your own citizens? And he would say, well, um, you know, Israel and America are trying to start a coup and say, I was like, just go back, let's go back to this. Why are you torturing people? And um, we never, I, I, I left feeling a bit disappointed because I never got to make him admit of, of the wrongdoings that are happening in the dungeons. And uh, I couldn't change anything. And how soon after that did you get put back in a prison cell? Like two or three months after that, I was um, thrown in solitary confinement for, for, for no reason. They came and arrested me and they said, well, we, we haven't really got anything. We just, we're just gonna live here forever. Secret police again? Secret police, yes. Oh, and describe what this dungeon was like. It's a, it's a two meter square cell and solitary confinement is a... Uh, underground. Underground. Uh, you can't tell day from night and you can't... Any daylight? Is there... No, no, nothing. And uh, it's two, two stories, two floors down. And there's a, a hole in the corner where you go for toilet. And uh, there's blood splatter all over the walls and there are just writings of people who've been there for, before me. And they said, you'll live here forever. And I had, I wasn't beaten up, but things happened in that cell which were a lot worse than being beaten up. Um, and, uh, what do you mean? I was, I was very badly abused. <laughs> I was violated. <laughs> but, um, by, by the guards? Um, I, I, I don't think I'm, I can talk about it. No, no, fair enough, fair <laughs> Sorry. Fair um, and, uh, I didn't want to live in that cell forever because um, I genuinely like I, I, I really loved life back then and I wanted to live my life fully and uh, but it was very depressing and it really <laughs> messed with my mind yeah. and um, how long were you in there for I ended up staying also ironically for two weeks but then because I was a good teacher luckily one of my students uncles paid a massive bribe to get me out but uh, it would have been that I would be sacked as a teacher, wouldn't be able to work as a teacher anymore, and signed to work as an informant with the police, and also that I would never leave Syria anymore. But by then, I was like, there's no way I can stay. Like, I left that prison. If you hadn't had the bribe from a, a relative to get you out... I would have still been there. You'd still be there? Yeah. And what, what do you think that experience would have done to you by now? It would have definitely, like, I... I <laughs> That's why I struggle, Pierce, when someone calls me a hero, because I'm not a hero, because I couldn't last two weeks there. People have, and some other Syrians were put in that, those solitary confinements for a decade or two. Mm. One of my own cousins was there for 16 years. So In an underground? In an underground dun dungeon. I couldn't, especially like because there, was, there were too many layers to the trauma. So the first time he got beaten up, tortured, and then the second time this happens, you just... I, there was no way that I could stay there. So you decided now, I've got to leave Syria. I've got to leave Syria. It's a heartbreaking moment. Yeah, because Syria is all and I you're knew. you're leaving your family as well. You, you're just... And where, did you know immediately I want to go to England? No, it, no, 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 no. Where I, did you want to go? I didn't want to go to Europe at all, or England, or anywhere else. So, and that's why in 2012, 2013, when Syrians were leaving Syria, they stayed in the region. So I literally, I lived in between Egypt, Turkey, Lebanon, and the UAE for like three years. Sometime here, sometime there, like doing jobs here and there, thinking that it will be over soon and we will go back. Because it's, you know, like you, there, there, there isn't this, again, this fascination is that I want to migrate somewhere else. We were very content in my homeland. But it just, it couldn't work out. It was really hard to settle, really hard to navigate. And your homeland is a war zone. It's, yeah, it's, it's like the worst proxy war in modern history. So uh, it was difficult to settle. And everywhere I went, I was given a, 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 a visa or a permit which had an expiry date. And I, there was no way that I could rebuild. You know, I couldn't find, I couldn't settle. Uh, so in 2015, I was like, I, 
and when the Russians got involved, actually, mm. I didn't see an end in sight. I was like, this is not going to be over soon, and we should probably start thinking of where do we go next. Mm. And that's why I decided to go to England. Getting to England is not easy. Really difficult. If you have no passport. Mm. So talk me through the journey that you took. In, two in 2015, 2016, I think around a million people have uh, done the journey into Europe, and I was one of them. And everyone I met in Turkey before we boarded these dinghies, the majority wanted to go to Sweden, Germany, uh, Finland, Belgium, Holland. And I remember saying, yeah, I'm going to England, and people were like, good luck with that, because it's, it's, it's almost impossible. Why did you want to go to England? <laughs> Purely because I could speak English. Honestly, that was right. the only reason. Right. And I, having lived what I've lived through, I, I, I just wanted to get there and I, wasn't, I couldn't learn a new language. I just wanted to start again. My life hit rock bottom and I just wanted to, it will, it will be the easiest for me to integrate. You're a filmmaker and yeah. you had your phone and you had your camera and you were recording some of this and it turned out to be a, a BAFTA winning documentary. And we'll come to that yeah. a little later, but I watched it again last night, the moment that you bored this dinghy and you're the last group to get on. There are 60 odd people. Uh, a lot of kids, women, uh, all, talk, all types of people. And we're looking at the, the picture here. The video is, it's incredibly harrowing mm. and it gives a completely different perspective on the way people may perceive these dinghy journeys because water starts to creep in quite quickly and you all start to think that you, you may die, you may yeah. just drown out here. You're outside the boat clinging on. When you look at that picture of yourself, did you think you were going to get out of this alive? No. And um, aside from all of that that you just mentioned, is also the disappointment um, that we got to be treated like cargo. Mm. Um, you know, you never, I never imagined that this would happen to me in my life. I saw it happening around me in, in Iraq, in Lebanon, people fleeing. But I never thought that there would be a day where I would have to do this. And it's very disappointing that we had to, you know, like... Uh, do this because it's a, it really affects you both physically and again and mentally because it's very degrading. And there's a moment when a young kid who's at the front of the dinghy turns to you and is, is desperate. It's like, He's like, Ammo, help me, help me, what help can we me. do? And you help feel me. completely helpless. I, I didn't know what to do. Uh, around me on that boat, there were two university professors. There was an electrical engineer and there was a belly dancer. and. There was the teacher and there were the other. The, the. To me, Syria was on that boat. And uh, just the, the seeing this happening, really, it's, 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 again, it's, it's depressing. And especially that you see children have it doing this. Because mind you, we're young men. You know, it's, it's, it's horrendous. It's, um, it's like no one, has to, no one has to ever do, like no one has to ever encounter this or do this. You end up, the Coast Guard do come, they save, I think everybody was saved. Yeah, we were all rescued. And then eventually you do get uh, later as far as the Calais jungle. Yeah. And another brutal experience. Two months, two months. And, and every single day that you're there, you were walking for hours a day yeah. to try and get on a train or a lorry or something to get you to the UK. Mm. But you had no passport. There was no legal way to do this. Yeah. You didn't exist yeah. legally. Did you think you'd ever get out of Calais? No. Um, and Calais, loads of people would get to Calais and try for a while and then go back somewhere else. And uh, I never thought that I would make it. Um, tried every way. I've been like in dozens of lorries and tried on the train. I just couldn't make it. And you would be, you'd be stopped every time? Stopped every time by the French police and be sent out. And, uh, and you're sent back to somewhere that became known as the jungle. The jungle. I mean, I never liked that phrase. Yeah. Because it dehumanized yeah. the people there, like yourself, who, you know, what are you, animals? Is that why they're calling it a jungle? Yeah. How did you feel about it being called the jungle? It's, it's dehumanizing, as you said. And people, not just this, Kale, Pierce, like throughout the journey, people with like numbers, 300 people here, 200 people here, like no one, no one managed to you know, read behind the, 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 the headlines or like read behind the numbers. There are, there, these are actually people who you, anyone could have easily been one of them, mm. but because of the geographical well, lottery. desperate people. Yeah. Desperate for a better life. Yeah. Who've been displaced from their yeah. country in millions because of the appalling war and atrocity. Yeah, and an accident of birth, you're born somewhere, you're born somewhere with, a, with, a, with a worthless passport. And if something happens, your only way out is a dinghy or a lorry. 
you get eventually a, a fake passport. You become <laughs> Bulgarian. First, I was a Czech, and then Bul I got caught on a Czech passport, and then but I being a Bulgarian <laughs> got you through. Um, <laughs> Everyone loves a Bulgarian. <laughs> and you got on, you got on a plane to London uh, with your fake passport, mm. and you managed to get here. And six months later, you got political asylum, and you're officially a, an asylum officially seeker who got asylum. Yeah. Again, asylum seekers get demonized, but you know, when I look at your story and the person you are and what you went through to get there, I think if people knew that story, they might be a little less yeah. trigger happy to demonize yeah. asylum seekers. Yeah. It's, again, it's so, it's so easy to judge people without getting to know them. I think the fact that we don't, people are afraid of what they don't understand. And a lot of people in the West don't understand this. And that, but when they meet the people, when they meet someone like me or the millions of others who had to do these journeys, I think it will trigger something in them. Because um, again, I told you, I would never, I didn't, I never wanted to do this. You, just, ma you made, a, crucially, you made a film about it. Yes, because and I wanted to challenge this rhetoric. And people, this, this became part of Exodus Journey to Europe. It won a BAFTA, and you made a very powerful little speech when you won the BAFTA. <laughs> First of all, could you, could you believe you were winning a BAFTA? It's so surreal. You've gone from a dinghy. <laughs> yeah, 20 months after fighting this. Fighting for your life. And then a few <laughs> months later, you're, you're a BAFTA winner. <laughs> Very surreal. But um, going back to why I wanted to make this film is because I wanted to challenge this rhetoric. Um, people were questioning why we had smartphones. People were questioning why some of us were wearing Nike shoes or like just nice clothings or why, why we could speak English. So I thought there was a gap of misunderstanding. So I wanted to put a face on the crisis, and uh, it, did, it did do that. It did, it did uh, a yeah. huge effect. It, it, it had a huge effect. It put a face on the crisis because there were five other people in the, in the documentary. And uh, it was, I also fil like, I filmed it not knowing that 20 months later I'll be in London giving a BAFTEX speech because of the, I won an award for it. So. Well, it was a powerful film, and it had a huge effect on people in the right way. And then ironically, the pandemic erupts. Yeah. <laughs> and once again, you become a face of the crisis. <laughs> and you do it with just one simple selfless act where you go to the local hospital, Whips Cross Hospital in East London, and you just volunteer to be a cleaner on a COVID ward. Now, to put it in perspective, that's back in, in March yeah. when a thousand people a day are dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During the no peak. one knows much about this virus. You've described it, and this is, given what you've been through, an amazing statement as the scariest moment of your life when you first don the PPE yeah. and go in because you don't know if you're going to die. Yeah. And because this time the, the enemy is invisible, <laughs> there were, the level of uncertainty was very high and I could see the confusion and the chaos in the hospital and no one had any idea what's going on. And I, I purely wanted to help, selfishly, because I could never do a lockdown and uh, I'm going to be honest, and um, this will get me out of home. And, and also because I was reading that loads of people on the front line were contracting the virus and dying. So cleaning is an essential part of the, of the fight against You this. were fearful for your life every day you went in, right? I was. I was, I was, <laughs> I was very stressful and I was very... People were dying. I mean, health, yeah, health I was very afraid. were dying. And I, I remember I, when we went in, I, I, I would like... Double, ma double surgical masks, and I couldn't look in the patient's eyes because I couldn't understand this and what's happening around me. And I, I'm afraid of hospitals in general, so I, I, I really struggled. But then I looked at my colleagues who happened to be from over 10 countries in, in, in that COVID war. They were all, they were all like fighting this like a unit. 90% of your colleagues were foreign nationals yeah. who come to work in the health system. And you came to our attention as a country when you heard that the British government uh, was going to basically charge immigrant NHS workers a surcharge, which they were then going to increase, actually, um, from £400 a year to, I think the plan was then to £600. And, and that secondly, that if you were to die, any of you, risking your lives to save other people, then your families would have no protection and could be deported. And you thought, I'm just not having this. That's not right. <laughs> and you took your phone, you went out during a busy shift, you got in your car, you did, I think, two, two goes at it. <laughs> Unbelievably raw and passionate. I just want to play uh, a bit of the clip that you put up. 
Hi Boris. Hello Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Hassan Ad and I am proudly working as a cleaner in a hospital 10 miles away from the hospital which you were in. I joined around the same time actually because I wanted to help this nation overcome this pandemic. Um, I've been really enjoying the clapping that you and your fellow ministers and the government do every week. Today, however, I felt uh, betrayed, stabbed in the back. I felt shocked to find out that you've decided, your government decided to exclude myself and my colleagues who work as cleaners and porters and uh, social care workers who are, uh, we are all on minimum wage. You've decided to exclude us from the bereavement scheme. So if I die fighting coronavirus, my partner isn't allowed for it, isn't allowed an indefinite leave to remain. This had an amazing impact and it blew up on social media. Millions of people viewed it. And well, you got a U-turn. <laughs> you know, the most extraordinary thing about this year is it's people like you and Marcus Rashford and others who've really shamed the government into correcting horrible policies. And you got the U-turn on the bereavement, then there was a U-turn on the surcharge. So effectively, immigrant NHS workers got equality. Yeah. And they got it because actually, you as a filmmaker realized the most powerful way to communicate what you were all thinking and feeling was through the power of film. It was my protest. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I didn't have to go on the street and shout this time like what I did in Damascus. I just had to go in a car and thanks to social media and smartphones and the technology, as you said, I did it a couple of takes and I was so nervous and upset. And then I was like, I did one and I wasn't very happy with it. But I was like, just put it anyways. And then four hours later, it had five million views. And Priti Patel announced the, 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 that they will include everyone. And I, <laughs> I mean, I don't, it wasn't just me, because Keir Starmer was talking about this, you and like other people were making so much Yeah, but much you noise. were the face of it. And yeah. your story was the powerful cog in the wheel, which captured everybody's attention. And yeah. I honestly think without that, without you putting a face to the immigrant workers risking their lives for eight pounds an hour, I don't think there would have been a U-turn. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. But I would like to say that we all were, worked on this together. And uh, <laughs> I felt very proud. I was, I was, I've never felt this proud in my life before because I was effectively able to make change this time. Mm. And uh, especially like, because I genuinely like London is my home now. It's my adopted home and be, to be able to help my community and help my colleagues and do something in this time, it, would, it, it gave me so much pleasure. And speaking of U-turns and, and you, you mentioned Marcus and uh, you know, none of us, I shouldn't have had to do this and Marcus shouldn't have had to, to, to campaign to feed hungry children and Captain Tom shouldn't have to walk to, to, to raise money for the NHS. It's happened because there are failures, you know, and then we had to step up but it shouldn't have happened in the first place. You know, a hospital cleaner shouldn't be pleading with the, with the prime minister to protect his family if he dies. Well, the other thing that shouldn't be happening is food banks in a country yeah. like the UK. You went from being a cleaner on the COVID ward when things calmed down, you went and worked at the food bank. <laughs> Volunteered. <laughs> but because um, I did 65 days at the hospital and then I don't know, I mean, when, when you say heroes, NHS staff are heroes. They've been doing it for years and years and years. I did 65 days and then I couldn't, I mean, I hit a wall. Uh, so I, but I le left when they closed the wards. There were no more COVID patients back then. So I left and then took uh, some time to look after myself. <laughs> and uh, I'm volunteering at a food bank once a week. Um, and it, it's, 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 I never expected that this would happen in England, that there would be food banks in my life. Um, but five years ago, I was queuing for food in Calais, people handing me food. So I've, I think you I've know got... What, well, you know what it means to be hungry. Yeah. You've spent days yeah. sleeping on the floor in a yeah. park with no protection and no yeah. food. And no one, had, no one should have to, 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 to go through this. No one. So I, I, I mean, I'm playing a very small part and I'm... I, I'm... Well, you played a big part and <laughs> we now all know you. You know, you're kind of famous. <laughs> How have you dealt Not with... Not as famous as you. <laughs> Well, we had a moment on air, actually, which really was a powerful moment for me when you suddenly stopped me in the middle of one of my full throttle rants. And you went, you know, you've changed two peers in this. And I, I was quite like, OK, this is a weird moment. Um, but I think everybody's changed in the pandemic. Yes. In some way. How have you felt yourself changing, do you think? I didn't come here with uh, politically, I'll tell you. 
because I, for, for four years now, I have been politically homeless before the pandemic. I didn't come here and I didn't, I didn't get involved. I didn't, felt, I didn't feel like it was in my place to speak about uh, um, politics in the UK because I'm an outsider. But this has changed my views because mm. while I can't vote, but it's, I think it, I am within my full rights as a refugee to, to speak out and to get involved because <clears throat> I am tired of being at the receiving end of advocacy and fundraising and, pot and, and, and lobbying. I, we can do it for ourselves you too. Must keep, you must keep using that platform. Yeah. But ultimately, we started with a dinner table in Damascus. Your family have all been split around the world now, but is your dream ultimately to go back to Damascus and to have dinner there again with your family? Without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, it's, if I could go there knowing that I'm not gonna get arrested and, and, and beaten up, then definitely, and then like, yeah. I mean, I will miss London, but I would, uh, definitely I will be back. <laughs> Hassan, it's been such a pleasure. Pleasure is to, mine. <laughs> to interview you. Thank you. You may not see yourself as a hero, <laughs> but I bet everybody watching this <laughs> would consider you to be absolutely a hero. So thank you for what you've you. done for this country. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. Hassan Akkad, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Well